This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. Fast to freedom, Special edition of the Open the Voice Gate podcast. You normally hear the sultry tones of Iron Mike Spears during this part of the show, but he is not here for the special edition of the Open the Voice Gate podcast, which is a show that is found on the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network, as well as its own RSS feed on all podcasting platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you would like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes, and it'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site, where you will see the donation button, where you can do a one-time or a reoccurring donation. It is not an obligation. You do not have to, but we thank everyone who has previously donated to the show. Over the past year, as many of you know, we have been chronicling Dragon Gate USA from start to to finish. We discovered a lot of things along the way. We discovered just how bad Sabu was in 2012. We discovered just how good John Davis was for a short period of time. We talked about Pac and Akira Tozawa and Johnny Gargano and all of these guys that were amazing. But there was someone consistently throughout the series that entertained us and delighted us, whether he was in the ring or behind the scenes. And that man was Davey Richards. And in honor of finishing the Drangit USA Rewind and Rewatch series, we have put together a clip show of nearly every time we even mention the words Davy Richards on this show. If you fought along, this is stuff you've heard before, and you can now find all of your Davy Richards entertainment in one singular place. If you've missed a few episodes, this is a great chance to catch up on what we thought was far and away the most entertaining part of the Drangit USA Rewind and Rewatch series. So there's a lot here. I will guide you through it as we go along. We're going to talk about his three matches that he wrestled in Drangit USA, uh, a, a portion of time in Ring of Honor, where he became the champion and one of Ring of Honor's biggest shows ever. The Team Ambition Heist, which is, I think, you know, again, for as many good matches as we watched, for as much fun as we had during the series, covering the Team Ambition Heist, was my favorite thing that we did. So we have that to cover, as well as Davey's eventual collapse in Ring of Honor, how he left the promotion, which I think is a forgotten about and almost underrated story just because it's so funny and it's so Davey Richards and how that led him to working for Evolve once again. So I will lead you through it the entire way. Glad that you're here. I'm glad that we're reminiscing about the man, the myth, the legend, the American wolf that is Davey Richards. And we begin... With the second show in Dragon Gate USA history, this is Mike and I reviewing Davey Richards versus Shingo Takagi from Open the Untouchable Gate 2009. This next match, <laughs> match of the year. I'm so, I'm so excited. I am so excited. <laughs> match of the year. A match when I rewatched this, I had the fear case. I had the fear because. I did not do star ratings in 2009. I was not that much of a nerd at that time. I was too busy watching French art films. But. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was ner- I'll I was let a- that slide. I'm not I- even going to touch that mic. <laughs> I was a nerd for different things back then, Case. I was a nerd for different things. But this next match, one of the most fun and most brutal and special matches in Dragon Gate USA history. Like, we talk about lists. We talk about important matches in this promotion. This match was one of the most important matches in this promotion. I'm talking about... Davey Richards versus Shingo Takagi. 
Davey gets the win in 25 minutes and 45 seconds with the Kimura. Went four and three quarters. This was the proto jock wrestling match. I love this match. And I, I used to not. There was a long time where my favorite match on this show was Danielson versus Doi. And Davey versus Shingo was good. But it was like, oh, they did so much. Like, I right. don't know if all this works. Whatever. No, in 2020, as we are dealing with a bunch of comedy bullshit and independent wrestling, and we are, maybe it's just because we're on a lapse of good wrestling because the entire world has shut down. But Davey Richards versus Shingo Takagi was exactly what I needed in the moment. There's so much just fun stuff about this match because this match is ultimately dumb because Davey Richards is a dumb human being. Shingo Takagi is immensely successful, but seems like maybe he could be a little bit of a dumb human being. Mike Quackenbush is on commentary on this match, comparing Davey Richards to Dynamite Kid, which <laughs> feels so 2009 that Quack is on commentary, being compared to Dynamite Kid as a compliment, and that Davey Richards is in the focal point of a professional wrestling show. And they go out there, and it is exactly that. And it's a shame that the Voices of Wrestling flagship Twitter just recently uh, coined this term because now it's going to look like we're copying them when this is dumb jock wrestling personified. <laughs> because every time I wanted to get upset that they were doing a big move and then kicking out or, you know, Shingo's you know getting kicked in the head and bouncing right up. And I'm going, ah, is this dumb? No, it's not dumb. The story is brilliant. It just features two dumb guys who are too dumb to feel pain. And no matter how <laughs> hurt they are, they are going to continue inflicting pain until they can't anymore. David Richards does a tope suicide in this match. Where <laughs> Shingo's shoulder and flies three rows into the crowd. He wipes out the golden circle. These are people with lanyards, and Davey wipes them out. And then he bounces back up, howls at the mood, and continues his attack. This match is dumb in the best way possible. The fact that Davey does a shooting star press into a Kimura, which I forgot he did, that's a kind of a dumb combination in my opinion why are you doing a shooting star into a, an intricate submission but Davey does it he gets the win with it and it works four and three quarters I love this it is such a fun match that you describe his things and I apologize that the audio maybe gets a little bit harried because I'm laughing so hard this is just like the dumbest most fun match I've seen in months like it's good to remember how stupid people are and this was very much a bunch of dumb guys just doing dumb things. You, you missed my favorite spot of the match case. When Shingo backdropped Davey over the top rope right to the cement floor. Just yeah. thud. Yes. Dumps him. Just, it's unreal. Like, I, I tweeted this out a few weeks ago that I, I had been going back and watching some older shoot interviews on the High Spots Wrestling Network and... I watched both the the high spot shoot where they interviewed Kevin Steen and Davey Richards at the same time, and they kind of had it out there. And then about a year later, they have the Kevin Steen show, and, and Kevin is interviewing Davey, and they're on much better terms. And it just got me thinking about Davey Richards and just how fascinating he is. Like, oh, he's the best. A career that just it blows my mind in so many ways. I mean, he like low key has burnt so many bridges. But at the end of the day, I think if you ask most promoters, like, yeah, 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 I'll book Loki. Like, all right, fine, I'll book Loki. But Davey, who hasn't wrestled a match since July of 2017, when he lost his last match, by the way, is on a CZW show. It is a fatal four way match with Shane Strickland, Joe Gacy, Leo Rush, and the aforementioned Davey Richards. That's the last time he worked. And it's just, he just has a weird career to look back on because he comes in, he, like, PWG is like his first major indie just because, like, geographically, it was easier for him to get there from Washington than flying him to the East Coast. And then Ian starts using him. ROH, he comes in with this giant push, and there's been a rumor that he was supposed to beat Danielson for the belt on his first night. Gabe has said that's not true, but it was a, a longstanding rumor. And then he becomes, like, 
the guy. And this is the show where Brian Danielson, of all people, the godfather of independent wrestling, perhaps, is saying, you know, I'm not the best wrestler in the world. You know, you people, you come out, you buy your tickets, you cheer for, for whoever you want. But you should be cheering for Davey Richards was basically the point of his post-match promo. And you watch a match like this, and at the time, I mean, when the scene is littered with guys who are doing lesser versions of this and Davey's everywhere at this point, I can understand why this match might rub some people the wrong way. But we are so far removed from this era and I just loved it. I just loved this match for what it was. It's just like how things are now and how things are in wrestling. Again, this is another Dave Meltzer uh, 2020 uh, five, five and a half star, six star match. Like this is just an insane match. You have Shingo who like the big joke was that later he would form a stable called the Kotsky where Jay once gave the, per- the best comp I've ever heard where he is the... High school bully jock with his best friend Yamato in the front seat of his Trans Am, and he shoves Super Shenlong 3 and Chichiro <laughs> Tomonaga in the back seat. Says, Come on, nerds, we're going to go hang out. Versus <laughs> Davey Richards, who is the dumbest of the dumb. Like, j- just so people get a frame of mind, before Davey did some really dumb things throughout the remainder of his career, this was the first time he, this was wrapped right the first time he had a blow up with Ring of Honor, which. Sadly, this website is gone because he posted like this huge manifesto to Declaration of the Independence case. I this would have been before your time. Yeah, but, I don't know of this website. So, so this was like a big indie sleaze website in the Northeast. Was Declaration okay. of Independence? Joe Lanza, Joe Lanza will know all about Declaration of Independence. It was a big New Jersey Philadelphia thing. But so it would cover like your CZWs, your uh, New Jersey All Pros, like all those show, all those places. And he posted, like, this 2,000-word manifesto about how he thought he wasn't paid what he deserved in Ring of Honor and that he was, like, a wolf and that he was willing to ride on the Indies and that he, it was just, like, a big, like, uh, it, was a, it was a big, like, Dunzo manifesto letter that he wrote before this, like, before this match. And it was just, like, we were starting to—Davey was just starting to grow his brain. He was about to have, like, the most perfect, dumb wrestler brain over the next decade, like— I miss having Davey Richards around because you could always count on him to have, like, stupid matches that, like, no wonder, like, he's now, I guess he still is an EMT, which, God bless him, especially in today's climate, you know, he... Yeah, very the, true. The, the real troops, the EMTs out there right now. But uh, he just was, like, such a unique person that, like, just, like, this morning, like, when I like, woke up early to watch this show, I was psyching myself up for this match. And the match blew away what my expectations were of a match that I've seen four times ago where we just had dumb jocks doing dumb jock things, doing a shooting star into a Kimura. And then just – that Tope Konolo just needs to be repeated because he dives through the second – in the, the middle rope and the top rope. Does a Tope Konolo clips Shingo. Like, she, like I don't think this was called. I think he just decided he, he wanted to do this. Clips Shingo in the shoulder, goes flying over the bike rack rail deep into the crowd. Like, you weren't exaggerating when you said this was, like, third row. Like, he took out all the lanyard geeks. No, he, he vanishes. Like, <laughs> Davey goes off camera on this dive, and I'll let you finish, but I promise the listeners, this is not the last time we'll discuss the Davey Richards dive, because the next show, he does an even dumber dive that I will Zapruder for everybody, because it's unbelievable. But go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah. I need to learn how to gift, because just, like, doing a music video of Davey Richards and Dragon Gate USA is a nice thing that will be revisited a lot over the next few episodes because he's such a such a dumb jock. And that proceeded with a, after this match, we have to talk about the, his dumb jock promo he gave. Well, well hold on. So I, I just, I have to get this out. Yeah. Be- Davey Richards, what I've determined just now listening to you, Davey Richards is the embodiment of a walking, talking galaxy brain. Yes. That's, yes. that's what he is. And he's just coming off – this is – like I tried to frame this in the first episode of like looking at the independent landscape. Who are the guys? Because Davey was about to be crowned as the guy, but he had just burned his bridge with pro wrestling Noah. He's about to burn a bridge with Ring of Honor. Now he's working with Gabe again. That bridge is about to be burnt. He's going to just explode whatever Drangate path he had. He's going to go to New Japan, burn that bridge. He's going to go to Ring of Honor again, burn that bridge. Uh, pro wrestling Noah tried to book him in 2013 and he burned that bridge again. He no showed that tour. He no showed that, which he says he had a neck injury. Didn't want to fly. Whatever. He, it, ultimately the match was announced and then it 
ended up not happening. He's in Wrestle 1 for a little bit. He's in oh, Impact. Right. He's He started working a bunch of AAW towards the latter half of his career, and like some of those matches are actually pretty good. I mean, he wrestled Matt Riddle on an, on an AAW show, and this is kind of when Riddle had all of the buzz. He's just... And I and I'm not mocking Davey when I when I, or, or attempting to be mean when I call him dumb. I love the way Davey Richards has aged because a lot of what was maybe so wrong about Davey at the moment is now stuff that I miss and that I wish more wrestlers uh, thought about themselves in the light that Davey does. It's why I will always have a soft spot for a guy like Loki. Loki sucks, and he seems like a pain in the ass to deal with, and I wish he didn't take himself as seriously, but I would rather you take yourself too seriously like Loki than not take yourself seriously enough in this business. And Davey is on that same trajectory as a Loki, where he'll keep having return uh, matches announced, he'll keep canceling those dates, and it'll be the cycle of Davey Richards' life. And it's just... It's just fascinating to me, and I really encourage everybody to go back and watch this match because I had so much fun watching it. Mike, the post-match promo, you can get into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, for whatever they do on Patreon, I'm going to try to get Joe to rewatch this match because I feel like this is a match that would bring a smile to his face. Absolutely. But, but yeah, no, Davey Richards, this is a pro Davey Richards podcast, just so that we're all clear. Before we it's, the, it's the one political stance I'll make on here. I'm pro Davey Richards. I'll say it. Yeah. I'm not afraid to. So I don't have the exact notes of the promo, but this was typical Davey Richards at this time talking about how he believes that wrestling is between Ben. He's not going to do any fucking handshakes, but that guy over there, Shingo Takagi, is a fucking man. <laughs> Talked about how his wife said the famous Jen at this time, which if you remember some of the Ring of Honor promos that come later, Oh, just keep that in mind. <laughs> keep that in mind. Said that, oh, you only have one match this weekend. Is it going to be a tough one? And then she said, oh, I know who Shingo Takagi is. This is going to be a tough match. It's like, she was right. And then he like, and then, and then he like called out Brian Danielson and, and proceeded to snap on Brian Danielson because he doesn't want to be anyone's best in the world. He wants to be his own man. And just was an utterly bizarre, but incredible five minutes of a promo. Like it was very like mumble mouth, like, Probably like Davies had way too many concussions even at this point. Like, oh god, yes. And it just was like a great post match, just dumb jock promo. So that it's it's two stages because the first stage is the bad stereotypical Davy promo where he's mentioning his family and it just sucks. And then Danielson comes out and they're putting each other over and I I, I was kind of tuning out. I was just like, oh God, okay, all right. Uh, this is a Davy promo. Let's get on with it. And then Davy turns heel. He spin kicks Danielson. He says, I don't need nobody's endorsement. And then poses on the rope with this mean mug face. And I was like, holy shit, I'm ready to follow this guy into battle. Like <laughs> Davy Richards flipped like that in a second he was evil and i was so on board with it i like genuinely unironically once davy turned on danielson i was like i i am into this whatever this guy is doing i am following him because he's so good at being that high school bully that jock that alpha and it was personified in that post-match angle it was awesome i loved it Davy Richards versus Shingo, a match that was certainly great in 2009, a match that I think would be equally as great in 2021. I wish that would happen. I wish Davy Richards would come back to the squared circle in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and I wish he would spin kick Shingo Takagi in the stomach and the feud would be on. Maybe Davy Richards could take out Tetsuya Naito. That is my own, my own cross to bear, my own grudge to fight, but I think that would be a very good booking by New Japan Pro Wrestling. So Davey versus Shingo was one of the first really great buzzworthy matches that Dragon Gate USA had, and it really helped give them an identity going forward that they were more than just the six-man tags, that they could go out there and they could have singles matches on the level of what Ring of Honor was doing at the time. And we saw that on the next show, Open the Freedom Gate 2009. This was a part of the Open the Freedom Gate Championship Tournament that was going on, a very convoluted tournament that Mike and I broke down in depth on that episode. The featured match of the first round was, at the time, 
two of the very best wrestlers in the world colliding. It was Davy Richards versus Yamato at Open the Freedom Gate 2009. Is this next match the match you think is the best match in DCUSA history? No. My, 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 okay. All right. The, I, I mean, I know we're totally aboard jock, dumb jock wrestling 2020 here, but this one was four and a half stars, though. Like, oh, I yeah. Love... No, let, let's be clear. I also gave this four and a half stars. I, I This is Davey Richards versus Yamato. This is the match simply dubbed Next Level. <laughs> Thanks, Gabe. I mean, my God. Ugh. <laughs> if Generation Now didn't annoy you enough, he had to one-up himself with next level. But uh, it is... Case, I can't wait till we get the moment where he starts saying everything is a main event in any place in the country, in the world. Well, you know, it's really a dream match when you think about it. Davy Richards versus Yamato. It's, you know, a I... special challenge. Actually, when I put my head down to my pillow, I will dream of this match. Because it was that much fun. <laughs> because Davey Richardson in 2009, I might need to go seek out the Ring of Honor stuff that he was doing. Because this was more Davey Richards being dumb chalk of the year. It is it, more so than the opener. This is really the generation now. Because you look at where these two guys are in their career. Davey is fully embedded in the American Wolves at this point. He and Eddie Edwards are main eventing Ring of Honor shows as a tag team at this point. He is looked at thanks to the Brian Danielson promo on the prior show, all of the work Danielson did to put him over on the Ring of Honor shows, all of the work Davey is doing in PWG at this point, Davey is looked at as the next big star on the independents. And Yamato in Japan is being groomed as the next big star in Drangi. We're only a few months away from him ending Naruki Doi's Dreamgate title reign and him holding the Dreamgate reign, or dream, the Dreamgate belt, rather, for the first time. Yeah. As, as for this match... Oh, you you take the floor. You go. I want to hear your thoughts first. This, my first note that I have is something that happened very early in this match, where he did this Topecon hello, where Davy Davy's dives are like my new like my new anti drug are Davy Richards dives because they're just so fucking ridiculous. Because <laughs> what he does is he does this Topecon hello, and it's really only kind of a Topecon hello. He kind of just he doesn't rotate fully, but it clips. Yoshi Eclipse you know, Yamato. I don't know how he just managed to close people. He goes right over. He sends Yamato through the barricade into the crowd, and then he's so proud of himself. He runs over to the ringside table where the dock and the ring bell is. He jumps up on the table, like flips out, like he's so proud of himself. He commands the ringside doctor to dap him up, and then he proceeds on terribly ringing the ring bell after doing it. And it is so special. It is my dumb jock moment of the show, Mike you're still underselling this moment. <laughs> so there's a moment before this that needs to be mentioned where Yamato and Davey go to the outside and Davey whips Yamato into the barricade. The barricade like Buckles. Un it like unhinges from the barricade it's connected right. to. And then there's a fan and it looks like it's a grown woman trying to get out of the way. Right. And Yamato was on the barricade. Davy kicks Yamato. Yamato falls into the barricade, and the barricade falls onto the woman, which is delightful. <laughs> it is beautiful. It and is then, such a dumb moment. There is this dive, and we didn't talk about it. The production on this show is a clear step down from what they did at Historic 8. There is less features. Like, there's a weird thing. After the opening match, they cut to Lenny and shikara -san, who just introduced the next match. Like, there's no reason for them to be on camera at all. They just threw it in as, like, a transition. I do not understand why they did that. But the arena looks darker. There's clearly not, I mean, there's, you know, no thunder sticks, which doesn't help. But there's, the, the atmosphere is not the same as it was for Historic 8. In the hard camera shot they were using, I mean, I guess it would have, it's not like, I mean, it's the arena, like the hard cam's the same for every show, but I felt like the hard cam was like higher and the ring just looked darker and it didn't look as pleasant as it did in the opener. But the fact is, Davey whips Yamato outside, Davey hits the ropes and they cut to the hard cam. As Davey is starting to dive, they cut to the floor cam and Davey dives so quickly, he has so much velocity on this Tope Suicida that the camera really misses him almost. <laughs> like, he's going so fast that the cameraman can't fully catch up with him. But, Mike, I watched this match, and I watched this exact moment at half speed. I slowed things down. I went—I I took it upon myself to slow things down to confirm 
what I think to be true is that we talked about in the last Davy match, the Davy Shingo match, how Shingo is just big enough and wide enough that Davy barely caught him. And that is, you know, it was a dive in air quotes, but really Davy was just launching himself into the third row, but he at least made contact with Shingo. My theory on this match is that Davy overshot the target. And if you look at it slowly, Yamato kind of jumps up and meets <laughs> Davy in the air. I think if Yamato stays planted, Davy just flies into the crowd. There is, I think there is a clear moment if you slow it down where Yamato lifts himself, himself up to where they clip shoulders. And that is it. And then as you pointed out, Davy daps up the doctor because that is what cool guys do. He howls like a wolf. And then from there, we proceed to have a really great match. Yeah, no. Uh, thanks for doing going real Jim Garrison on that. I, I had to Zapruder it. I mean, it was, I went frame by frame. <laughs> oh, God. Davey Richards is such a delight. Oh, God. But, you yeah, know, this match ruled. Like, it's just like his character is, he's just, he's the guy who's just too dumb to lose. And he's just like too, like, Davy Richards is Davy Richards. He's going to come at you, and you could catch him if you want to, but he's just going to go completely nuts. And it just was like such a fun match. Like 2009 Yamato, such a sleaze bag at this time, and it just was such a like really sweet moment. And then like they really teased the the back and forth with him until Yamato finally w hit a really nice snap brain buster like you forget how good of a brain buster Yamato has before hitting the gallery to win again four and a half stars like this match is just remarkable like going back and watching this like Davy Richards has the two best singles matches in this promotion to this date and we'll get to what happens to Davy after that but it's it's really awesome stuff there are some small Yamato things in this match that I really, really liked. There's a moment, and it's, I mean, it's minuscule. I mean, I, I you know, I, I could have been looking down at my phone and I would have missed it, but I just happened to be really engaged in this match. There's a moment where Davey has him just like in a very basic hold on the ground. It's in the opening minutes of this match, and it looks like Yamato was just about to reach the ropes just to get a rope break so things can reset. And right before he grabs the ropes, he transitions and counters Davey's hold and then gains control from there. And it's just a small thing that one puts over the legitimacy of Yamato's ground game at this point, which is uh, was, you know, the way he was hyped up at this time, which we've talked about on the first two shows of the Yamato we know now was a completely different wrestler than the, the Yamato of 2009. And then, I, I, I don't know, I, the dumb jock thing really works in Davy versus Shingo because they're both giving off that energy. Now, I also gave this match four and a half. There's a part of me that goes, man, this match could have been better had Davy had one or two really like key cells that I just don't think he picked up on because Yamato is a little bit more calculated and a little more cerebral with the way he goes about his attack. When Shingo is beating down on you, it's like a video game health bar, and your meter is just getting lower and lower and lower. But Yamato really targeted the knee of Davey Richards in this match, and there are times for as much as I genuinely enjoyed some of the no-sells Davey had, some of the fire that he showed, some of it that was really, really excellent. There were also times where I wish Davey would have just slowed down for a second and just given that knee a little bit more attention. I think had that happened, this would have been four and three quarters on the same level as Davey versus Shingo, but we're nitpicking a four and a half star match. I mean, at the end of the day, these are two guys that worked their asses off in a weird way. They were in the prime of their careers at this point. I mean, Yamato would go on to have some really great stuff down the road. This is peak Davey. We're in the best time of Davey Richards career at this point, And he's doing the bulk of his best work in Dragon Gate USA of all places. Yeah. And I think like this is like the start of Davy's peak that probably would be ending after that Elgin match, you know. So like it's interesting because like he's definitely fully realized here. And Yamato like up until Yamato's heel turn, like true heel turn, because Yamato's still kind of a tweener here. Like he was a member of New Hazard, but then he joined up with Kamikaze when soon after when Shingo left New Hazard, tried to be a tried to be a lone wolf, and then he was really bad in uh, Typhoon, which just was a real awkward fit, and then kamikaze came soon after that it is interesting like how yamato in a lot of ways like the progression of yamato especially like from 2009 
to 2012 when he becomes the almighty Yamato. Is it 2012, 2013? I'm thinking off the top of my head. Uh, he turns at the end of 2012. So, tw- so, so really 2013. Like, this is kind of the peak of where he was at right there. And he's fully realized the MMA stuff that I always bag him on and modern Yamato works really well here. And it works really well like Davey. Like, as you said, like Davey, if he would put a little bit more care into it and trying to do this, but it's also Davey Richards, I don't think he was necessarily the thought crosses his mind that he needed to sell the knee a little more. But it was just remarkable stuff, and it was a very special match. And it was a match that, like, it, it came out of it, and we saw something going to the main event that this match completely exhausted Yamato. Like, 20, 21 minutes, by far the longest match out of the first half of the show. And it was just a remarkable match. Like, if you're making a list of stuff you want to watch during this break, this is another match on there. Like, it's it's something remarkable. Mike and I talked about it there, but I cannot overemphasize enough how dangerous and stupid and awesome the Tope Suicida that Davey Richards did in that match to Yamato was. I fully, fully in my heart of hearts believe that Yamato had to leap in the air to prevent this man from just cannonballing into the first four rows at the ECW arena. It is a brilliant move from Yamato and a dangerously stupid and exciting move from Davey Richards. And that leads us, unfortunately into the final match that Davey Richards ever had in Dragon Gate USA. And you could hear the excitement in Mike and I's voice talking about those last two matches. Just the possibilities were endless in this promotion for Davey Richards. He goes through Shingo, he goes through Yamato, and then he ends up wrestling Masaki Mochizuki. And as we'll talk about in this, in this clip, it was the third time they had wrestled. They had wrestled once in Ring of Honor in a very forgettable match. They had wrestled once in Japan because, yes, Davey Richards did do tour a, a tour, singular, just one, of Dragon Gate in Japan where he wrestled Mochizuki. And then they go back to the, the Congress Theater in Chicago, the same building where Davey Richards wrestled Shingo, and they have one final match. It is the final time Davey Richards wrestles on the red and black Dragon Gate USA canvas. It is Davey Richards versus Masaki Mochizuki from Fearless 2010. I got to say, we had we had two title matches and a three-way tag team elimination match. But before we get into the next match, let's talk about something we talked about earlier, the first match between Masaki Mochizuki and Davey Richards. Yeah, so just real quick on their Dragon Gate match, which I don't, maybe I can try to make that available to the public i don't know i don't know what i'll do with that but i i sent mike the match because i had it laying around and i you know it's at that point the dragon Gate match was actually their second singles match because if you remember they wrestled each other at all-star extravaganza 2 uh when mochizuki came over for the second uh wrestlemania weekend ring of honor shows so this was weirdly davy versus mochizuki 2 it's a good match, much like their Chicago match. I actually, we were kind of talking before the show. They're roughly the same match. Uh, it's exactly what you would expect from these two. Just in the case of the Japan match, Mochizuki gets the win. And in the case of the fearless match, Davey comes out on top. Right. And it's interesting that we'll get into this in a second. Like The, the match here is very emblematic of what Dragon Gate audiences were at the time. Davey and Dragon Gate proper was never going to be a great fix. If he was a member of Kamikaze, he would make sense because he would fit in with the vibe there, and he was teaming with Kamikaze on this tour. But the crowd response to nearly everything was pretty lackluster. But the match itself was just... It was just was very interesting to me. It was, it was worked in a way that a non-Dragon Gate crowd would probably be a lot more into it, almost to the detriment of the match itself and its and how it came away with it. But it just was something that like it happened. It was cool to see... Especially, like, this was a time where Mochizuki was was kind of cycled down in Dragon Gate. He was mostly teaming with Don Fuji. Great underrated tag team, especially if you're someone who wants to watch some more of the hard-hitting Dragon Gate style. Mochi Fuji was a great tag team. But it just was, like, one of those matches you watch. And, like, looking at the promotion in context, you could see why this Hokkaido crowd was just, like, sitting on their hands during it. Yeah, Davey in Japan, for Dragon Gate specifically, just... Did not work. I- it just looks weird. And when you look at even Davey's cage match, like the Dragon Gate USA stuff, yeah, it's Dragon Gate USA gave it to the star. Davey Richards was the star at the time. Him touring in Japan, I I would like to know more about how it came about. And, you know, uh, for a number of reasons, it didn't continue. 
but it just and watching this match, which again is a good match, but it feels so out of place in the landscape of of the promotion at the time. It's it's really fun in a way. I wish we had that Tanazaki match to have a larger sampler sample size of what Davey did with his time overseas. It's just very strange to look back on. I imagine it was very strange in the moment, and it's a blip on the utterly bizarre career of Davey Richards. You know, and it's just a bizarre career. Yeah, yeah, no, this is just like a part of it. He worked one tour in Dragon Gate, and this was the match of it that made tape. He left before a Final Gate because that was traditional for the Gaijin to go home for Christmas. So, like, that was it for him in Dragon Gate. But getting into this match, uh, this FIP match with Davey and Mochizuki, I have a little fact nugget that you might know, Case, you might not know. I just okay. want to throw out there. This was not Mochizuki's first match in Chicago. Oh, okay. You, I thought I had Mochizuki in America trivia, but you have clearly stumped me. All right. Masaki Mochizuki had a match where he talked about it after Koji Katao died, that he came and he wrestled as Hideo Nomore in, on October 21st, 1995, on a AAA ship. Okay, I'm looking at this now, and I'm enthralled. Keep going. I remember him talking about, like, this was, like, one of the matches where he was trained to be a karate fighter, and he was told, oh, you're going to be doing wrestling now, which was a very common thing in the 90s, and especially in Japan. Like, if you were a mixed martial artist, you would be brought into wrestling. And this was, like, one of his first matches. Because, you, like, you take a look back at uh, at Cage Match, and I'm certain there's more matches like this, but this was maybe his ninth match ever was in Chicago, Illinois. And he talked about it, like, after Kochi Katao died, about, like, how it was as a student of Katao and being like forced into wrestling and having to go to America for a match. So yeah, this was the second time that Misaki Mochizuki wrestled in Chicago. Okay, I'm blown away because I also had a Mochizuki tidbit about oh. him wrestling in the States, but I have to look at this card again. Okay. It's a six-man tag between Cactus Jack, Psychosis, and Sabu versus Rey Mysterio Jr., Super Calo, and Winners. It is a six-man tag with Public Enemy and Tommy Dreamer versus the Eliminators and Two Cold Scorpio. I it's that literally, show. I literally just sent someone a DM asking if they had this footage or if this footage exists. I am completely fascinated by this show that I did not know existed. I mean, it's AAA when they were in the '90s, especially like in the, like their because this was. I'm trying to remember when, when Wind's World Collide was. My, my brain is so devoted to Dragon System stuff that... It, it would have been big... 94. I think October yeah. of 94. So this is like right after it when AAA was doing a bunch of shows in America. And I guess... I, I, I'm right now going to look up to see what else Koji Katao was doing in 1995 because it is just like a, he has had such a... He has such a wild and bizarre career. And of course, coming out as a former... Uh, he was the uh, former Yokozuna that was kicked out of Sumo. So... It's just kind of a wild he, – he, it's a wild ride with, with Koji Katao. Well, I was going to bring up that this – I was going to say it was that uh, in between his Ring of Honor debut and then this match, Mochizuki worked in the States one more time, which is true. But do you remember what show Mochizuki would have tech- – in think America as a whole here that Mochizuki would have worked in between these two shows? Oh, Hawaii. Yes, which have you seen these Hawaii shows? So Dragon Gate partnered with Action Zone Wrestling in September of 2008. They put on a show in Hawaii that featured Kness versus MKZ, Horiguchi versus Tanazaki, uh, Mochi Fuji versus Gama and Kanda, and Hulk Yoshino and Doi in the main event versus Dragon Kid Pac and Shingo Takagi. Have you seen this show? I don't know if this show ever made tape. So I think I've seen the main event. Okay. I think that one aired on an infinity. This is just – this is – if you're ever wondering, oh, I wonder what Mike and Case talk about off the air. It's <laughs> us sending us links to shows and going, have you seen this before? Do we have access to this? Um, as for Davey versus Mochizuki in Chicago, it is a weird parallel to everything that is happening on this show where it is not bad, but is it is a slightly lesser version of what be, what came before it. Mochizuki versus Davey is – 
a less entertaining dumb jock match than Davy versus Shingo. The dive Davy does into the crowd is still stupid, but not as stupid as the dive he did versus Shingo and way, way not as stupid as the dive he did versus Yamato. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt is... you here. He yes, didn't even ahead. touch Mochizuki in this dive. How can we say that this is less dumb? I feel like he caught him there. Again, the Yamato dive, Yamato has to jump for Davy to catch him. That's At least fair. I thought Davy I thought Davy grazed him here. He still man, he hit the ground so hard. I cannot believe he was doing these dives. Cause I just don't like I Davey. don't know. I like I'm not a wrestler. I don't like like I I have a very low pain tolerance. It's unfortunate, but like it plagues me. Like I just don't like being in pain. It makes me very uncomfortable. David Richards is hurling himself at the concrete floor with the added obstacle of there being a steel guardrail in between his pursuit of high speed velocity and crashing almost neck first onto the ground. Like that was probably I would say the the peak of this because these two guys, for like whatever reason, I don't think they had great chemistry. No, they they don't, and I don't know why that is. Because Davy would do really well against guys that worked his style, and Mochizuki has proven, you know, that he can brawl and kick and strike with the best of them. But these two together just never really meshed. Yeah, and like that's the disappointing thing about this because. Mo- Saki Mochizuki, I guess, over like the last four years, has kind of become my favorite wrestler to watch in the ring. Especially since Akira Tozawa left Dragon Gate. Whenever there's a Mochizuki match, like y- you've recorded enough audio to me to know, like I get like a certain lilt in my voice. And I get a little excited as soon as this happens, and this just did not reach that level that you would think. Especially how you would think about 2020 Mochizuki, not not happening in, in 2010, and it's kind of disapp- disappointing because this could have been like. Another one of those matches in the Pantheon where we'd be like, Masaki Mochizuki is the, one of the 10 best wrestlers of all time. But we can't say that because this match did not work that well. It's I, one of those things with Mochizuki where, I, first of all, I think if there is a dip in his career, it is happening between 2008 and 2010 because he's sure. de-emphasized in the booking. There's still really, really good stuff. All of the Fuji tags. Again, he has the one good Aki Bono uh, match in Dragon Gate. There's a lot of stuff that he's doing well. But if there is a dip, it is this time period. But we're also talking about someone who, like, I gave this match four stars. We're talking about it like it fell flat on its face and that it's, you know, a, a two and a half star special. I gave this match four stars. It's just when you put Masaki Mochizuki in the ring, even at this time, but especially now, I mean, I, uh, when you were saying, you know, your piece on Mochizuki there, I'm thinking, well, God, I, Masaki Mochizuki, I guess he is my favorite wrestler of all time. I mean, it would be him and Kenta and, and Rey Mysterio to some extent, and maybe the Young Bucks, but there's no one I enjoy watching more than Masaki Mochizuki, especially now that we're living in a post Akira Tozawa in Dragon Gate universe. And so we're, we're mourning this match that was still great. But Mochizuki has just messed up our standards for what he is outputting. Like, it's just insane yeah. to think, it's like, oh, only four stars. But it's four stars and it's Mochizuki versus Davey. And there is, and it is unfortunate that we never get to discuss Davey again because there is just a, a strange, perverse, but genuine entertainment I have watching Davey Richards in the context of the 2020 wrestling landscape. Well, we'll, we'll look at a lot of perverse enjoyment talking next episode. We still have one more episode with Davey. So it's okay, Case. We'll get through it. But this is the last entering match for Davey Richards in Dragon Gate USA for this stint. So Davey beats Mochizuki. He wins back the FIP World Heavyweight Championship. And then all hell breaks loose. Like I said, that is the last time we saw Davey Richards in the ring. And the next time that we would talk about him would be on the next episode, Open the Ultimate Gate 2010. This was the first WrestleMania weekend for Dragon Gate USA. It was uh, the WrestleMania weekend in Phoenix. So you had Ring of Honor there, and you had Dragon Gate USA there, and with the exception of 2006, when you had Ring of Honor and IWA Mid-South running pretty close to each other, and, and with loaded lineups, you know, obviously 2006 Ring of Honor is Blood Generation versus Do Fixer, Danielson versus Roddy, and Danielson versus Lance Storm. IWA Mid-South had Loki versus Necro Butcher, and they had Chris Hero versus Milano Collection AT. 
the fan bases were similar, but I think different enough to where it wasn't this incredibly heated competition that weekend. But you go to 2010, it's Ring of Honor, Strangate USA. They are fighting for the same fan base, those same dollars and Phoenix. And Davey Richards becomes the center of controversy that weekend. The Young Bucks to an extent, because TNA gets involved and they're a whole other deal. But Davey Richards, WrestleMania week in 2010, this is the moment where the U.S. independents, as we recognize them, with this split between the Gabe Sapolsky camp and the Ring of Honor camp that lasted through the closure of Evolve in 2020, this was it. This is where everything started, and we have all of the news on what went down between Davey Richards, Gabe Sapolsky, and Ring of Honor. January 29th, 2010. A tweet from the Drangate USA Twitter account. Effective immediately, Davey Richards has been removed from all DG USA and Evolve events. I have been advised not to make more comments now. That is followed by a statement on February 1st, the DG USA Newswire, in which Gabe Sapolsky writes, Wesley, Davey Richards is no longer with Drangate USA. Open the Freedom Gate champion BB Hulk now has an open contract for the March 26th event. Hulk says he wants the toughest, most skilled opponent possible. He guarantees a title match that you will never forget. Uh, and then goes on to do all of his plugs. So we are now at a point a week after announcing the main event for your flagship first ever WrestleMania weekend shows. The American that you have built your promotion around. The American that has drawn the most eyeballs to the promotion, the American that has had the best matches in the promotion, is now gone. And unfortunately, it wasn't as simple as just a tweet, and it wasn't just as simple as a peaceful goodbye. Things would get much more intense. The February 15th, 2010 Wrestling Observer Newsletter has the bulk of this information, where it says... And we'll do this in the in the most concise way possible that Davey was earning three hundred fifty dollars per match for regular Ring of Honor shows and two fifty for the television dates. Uh, when Gabe Sapolsky started using him, Gabe was trying to use less and less Ring of Honor talents when he started up his new groups, both DG USA and Evolve, fearing that there would eventually be some sort of retaliation or some sort of contractual dispute. But Gabe had offered Davey five hundred dollars per shows to be the top star. So not only is Davey working. Uh, Dragon Gate talent. He's going on Dragon Gate tours. And there was an entire promotion that was initially based around Brian Danielson. Well, who was the successor to Brian Danielson? Well, it's Davey Richards. So Davey was financially compensated for attempting to make the jump to Gabe and then was creatively rewarded, at least in theory, for those ideas. According to Gabe Sapolsky, he thought Richards only had a contract that related to Ring of Honor television which, as I said, makes sense uh, because he didn't want a problem like this to arise. Ring of Honor had always maintained Richards was under contract to them, although the contract wasn't exclusive, and they never attempted to get Richards to not work for Dragon Gate USA or Evolve. Richards was told after Dragon Gate USA advertised Richards only appearing on their shows that a Ring of Honor was going to attempt to get an injunction to pull him off the shows. His contract, which didn't expire until April of that year, was not exclusive, but Ring of Honor believed that they had priority on his bookings, particularly when it came to a rival group running head-to-head. -head. So let's pause here for just a second. Yeah. And let's take a look at the independent landscape because Ring of Honor is not in a great position at this point. Adam Pierce is booking, they're on HGNet, but things are not going well. And wanting to protect a top star like Davey Richards, if you have any sort of written agreement, I can't say I blame them for wanting to prevent Davey to work for Gabe's side. Yeah, and I last night compiled a ridiculously long doc of basically the whole entire thing. And the first like mention they have of Davey in Dragon Gate USA was they were under the belief that there was no contract. However, ROH isn't saying anything negative about it. So it seems like at least my read of the situation was that when he agreed to come aboard uh, WWN, as I'm just going to call them, it's just easier. That's what they're called now. I think Gabe and Sal Hamawai were under the impression that there was just not going to be a big deal. And this kind of continues. Uh, the Observer talks about it two weeks later that he is under contract here. And everyone seemed to be like out in the dark and this kind of is a real depiction of the uh, landscape that ring of honor was in something that i i pulled that i really wanted to talk about this actually is from uh, brian alvarez in the uh, figure four weekly from august 25th 2009 this was about when danielson signed and it said that the that 
Davy Richards was rumored, and the rumor probably got started because Danielson's ROH contract expired, and he was scheduled to work the Dragon Gate show next month, since Richards also scheduled to be on that show. People assumed that he wasn't on contract either. This is an important point because someone on the WWE side noted that WWE, even if they're keeping keep close tabs on the shows, we're not going to make offers to anyone under contract in a wrestling company in the United States. Of course, the WWE source added, there's been a few blunders where Johnny Ace's incompetence created situations that wasn't the case. But right now, WWE isn't really even aware of Ring of Honor. Yeah, that is a very damning look at what is supposedly the number three in America in a company that, again, it's not like Ring of Honor was a hole in the wall. India wasn't your local VFW joint. I mean, it's it's Ring of Honor professional wrestling and they're on TV, but we're still six or seven years from the the indie boom or I guess the signing boom rather. I mean, Brian Danielson signing with WWE was more of an anomaly than the trend at this point. And so the idea of Johnny Ace, who... I think anybody listening to this at least knows his signing patterns. It doesn't surprise me that Johnny Ace is not sitting down and watching his HD net tapes. I mean, it makes sense that the independent landscape is purely independent, that that idea of working towards a contract is is more of a pipe dream than it is a, a means to an end. Yeah, and I didn't include this in to my document, but there was like a comment made about when Danielson signed, it was more of, well, I guess this is the time I sign. <laughs> it, it wasn't necessarily like he was such an aberration that like he was going to apparently end up with a WWE contract sooner rather than later, which also makes sense given who his trainers were and the fact that he was under WWE, I think it was WWF at that time, contract and the uh, when he was in Memphis very shortly. So it's such a weird thing. And then we talked about Ring of Honor being here, but living through like this time of the Indies, and especially, like, as someone who was not in the Northeast, someone who was not in the West Coast, someone who was not even in the Midwest, there were only a couple of indies that were really, really making making waves and that you would read about and people would post about. You get people post about, like, their local stuff. Like, I remember hearing of WXW from the people from Europe tweeting about it, or not wouldn't even tweeting, posting about it. But really, you had Chikara is probably at its business peak at around this time. It was getting constant coverage. Uh, IWA Mid South was on the down end of the slope, but the the idea that like Smart Mark Video was such a big deal at this point was that you had all these promotions that were through Smart Mark Video, and that's how you got the DVDs. I remember always going for the twenty five percent off sale. You you buy four and you basically get your you buy three and you basically get your fourth one free, and that was such a big deal then. But the landscape was so different then, and where people were and the gulfs between promotions is really worth noted because at this time, even after, like, especially being on VNW talking about this, it seems really well to talk about, even after, like, the peak of Gabe Sapolsky's era, there was a huge gulf between even Ring of Honor and TNA at this time. And it's something that only really changed, as you said, like, the last three or four years. Yeah, loyalty and just the way that is looked at in America has certainly shifted. In Japan, it's another story. And back to Davey, another key factor of him choosing Ring of Honor over Dragon Gate was Davey, who had recently gone on a tour of Dragon Gate, which we talked about in the last episode, uh, was leaving the promotion in Japan because he was booked on the upcoming Best of the Super Juniors tournament for New Japan and was hopeful at the time that it would lead to regular tours, which indeed it did. So all of this transpires, and Davey ends up telling Gabe at the January 22nd AAW show uh, that he's pulling out of the Dragon Gate shows in Phoenix because he signed a new contract and he can't work them for legal reasons. He also told Sapolsky at the show that he wasn't going, going to be doing any more tours of Dragon Gate because he was going to be in New Japan. He said that he signed a new contract because they gave him a raise to $500 per show, and Ring of Honor would be running more than Gabe would, which, which makes sense. So there immediately becomes... A bit of an issue here because Dragon Gate does not like, I guess, in, the, Dragon Gate has a very specific way of doing things. And was Drang, when Dragon Gate was made aware of the situation, they did not want Masaki Mochizuki doing the job, losing to Davey the next night uh, to someone that was leaving not only their company, but was moving to a rival Japanese company. Uh, but Gabe talked them into it, saying that the match would air on the March 5th pay-per-view, which would help set up Davey versus Hulk and Phoenix. Davey would job on the way out, the way business is supposed to be done, and everything would be okay. But Drenge was not happy about Masaki Mochizuki losing the title, and as it turns out, they had every right to be, because this is something that we still see in Drenge 
perhaps more so than any other company in Japan at this point, of this idea of loyalty is really, really crucial to them. The The reason that Mike and I made such a big deal about Ultimo Dragon working last year was because none of us ever thought it would happen. I mean, we got Shuji Kondo versus Masaki Mochizuki in January of last year, and that blew our minds. We never thought we'd see Kondo in a Dragon Gate ring again. The idea of loyalty is so ingrained in the Dragon system. I mean, TNA at this point, TNA had offered Naruki Doi and Masato Yoshino contracts, and Doi wanted to go, but he, he couldn't face his friends and his peers in the locker room and, and couldn't face them and say, okay, I'm actually going to go here now. So for Davey, who, you know, David Richards is a lot of things and he, he thinks for himself and Davey made a move for himself rather than for the organization. And Drangate was clearly upset at that. Yeah. And this is something that we will kind of get into when we get into really 2011 and 2012 DG USA. But there's a system at least with how, Dragon Gate views the Gaijin and how really Japan views Gaijin that it is acceptable like and they expect that okay like dating back to like Bruiser Brody that Gaijin won't necessarily say faithful unless they come up through our dojo or they spend a lot of time there and become members of the family and Dragon Gate was at this time I believe and I know it, it's especially is of the time now was a collaboratively run promotion it was basically the big joke for a long time was that Ginky Horiguchi was always the person in the Observer Awards as Dragon Gate Booker when he was really not the Booker. He was just the, the guy that would tell the Gaijin what the uh, results were or what the bookings were. So that's why they, they extrapolated that as when in reality it was a very collaboratively done company. I mean, people— Well, it still is. I mean, the yeah. roster sets up the ring and tears down the ring to my knowledge, and it could be different now, but B.B. Hulk is the one that runs merch, and you see the guys— almost like an independent promotion. Uh, if you follow any of the Dragon Gate accounts, mainly the office accounts that are on social media, you know, you'll see UT and BB Hulk and, and Yosuke Santa Maria, whoever else covered in sweat and cork and hall after their match, but they're at the merch table, they're selling t-shirts and it's not that independent contractor spirit that the Indies have, but it's the collaborative effort that they are all buying into this company vision. Uh, and it's, it's, I can see where people would maybe think that's, you know, lower rate or minor league to have your guys selling merch, but it's just the way Dragon Gate operates. Yeah, and the way it, it operates like that because this is a promotion that was built by Ultimo students. When they struck out on their own, the only office figures they had were Takashi Okamura and Toru Kido and, like, the music people and, like, the ancillary people, but the people who were, like, really in charge of it, like, the big thing was that that's why Madden got fired because he was in charge of something and he was caught misappropriating money. Like this was a, you know, I, I make the joke about it, but this is the, for a lot of ways. I, I'm not necessarily sure if that's the case now with now the fact that Okamura never owns, does not own it. And I don't know exactly how the percentage is now with Gaora now, but it's a collaboratively run thing. It's closest thing I think I've heard of, at least for like a major promotion that must be communally run. So it does look different than Pro Wrestling Noah at that time, or especially New Japan now, where they have the whole Bushi Road machine behind it, because this just is not how this company's ever run, because it's how the company was founded. So I, I think that's also the big thing there is, especially for someone like Davey, who in a three in a two year period would have worked for the three larger promotions in Japan at the time. He in two thousand nine he finished up with a Pro Wrestling Noah. He had that one tour of Dragon Gate that we talked about in the last episode, and then he'd be working for New Japan for the next three years. So he had, it, he necessarily, I mean, he was there for, I think it was 13 days, Case? Like, 13 days he was there and gone. Yeah. So, like, it's no realistic thing that he would get the sense of, okay, this is how this promotion operates. Well, and also just everything we know about Davey just as a person, which is not a knock on him, but... You know, Davey is someone that would show up late to indie dates, was checked out of wrestling, even by 2010, had shown signs of not really wanting to be there anymore, was always contemplating quitting. And the idea of showing up early and stretching with the group and then putting up the ring and then tearing down the ring and then selling merch like Davey Richards is is a robot in a way where he is programmed for himself only, whereas 
you know, Dragon Gate operates in a in a machine like way, but it's again, it's that collaborative effort. All of these parts come together to make one. Davy Richards is his only part, and his brain is a fascinating place that I would love to explore more and more. But it's clear that he, in ring stylistically, and both his personality do not mesh with Dragon Gate, which is why you can maybe hide that and you can maybe get away with that in Dragon Gate USA. I think as time would have gone on, Gabe would have had a harder time managing Davey and getting Davey on the same side as the Japanese office had they continued to work together. But it's why we made such a big deal last week about this Davey Japan tour, because it just doesn't make any sense to knowing the two sides. It, it's, I would really love to know more about how that came about because it's a fascinating two week period. Yeah. And we even got a letter from Davey and in this observer that I kind of want to touch on. And it just is one of those things where he talks about how he knew that the lawyers could get involved and that Gabe and Sal knew this. And they told me that the lawyers could fight for me, give me out my ROH obligations, whether or not they could, I don't know. And I don't care. I didn't get into wrestling for legal battles. If it was up to me, I'd gladly do both. And it's just very Davy, kind of like how his mindset is. And there's a lot of like background in this one observer. I think that the published date of this is March 15th or February 15th, 2010. So this is one of the lead stories in Observer. It's one of the few times that Dragon Gate USA is one of the lead stories. So it's definitely worth checking out because there's a lot here that kind of crystallizes how everything is. So I think we were on this or were we talking about one of the gay posts now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's at a point now where they had both threatened lawsuits and they had both talked a big game. And then at the end of the day, Ring of Honor had a written contract and, and they had more of more proof than Gabe did, who Gabe, you know, wrote a lengthy MySpace post in the middle of February talking about how. 95% of the time, his trust pays off. He's a guy that likes to trust people. He had been working on verbal agreements since 2002, and he understands that things happen. Guys get injured. Planes don't take off, whatever. But at the end of the day, Gabe advertises people on shows. He expects them to be there. And I just – Gabe – is a fragile human being himself. And that's not an insult to Gabe. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm, no. I'm, I mean, I, you know, I blew up in a, in a zoom call today. I, I yelled at a bunch of people over zoom, which is humiliating, but it's, it's what happens. Um, I have defended Gabe for a long time because I, I understand why he is the way he is to some extent. And I don't know him personally, but just his public persona, I empathize with it to an extent because I understand where he's coming from a lot of the time, even if he is wrong. And this is a situation where he is ousted from Ring of Honor. He has this new promotion, which is in a very weird spot, like we talked about at the top of the show, where there's critical praise, but he's already struggling with the business of it. And his guy that he had pushed all of his chips in on was now no longer working for his promotion. I understand why Gabe would be upset. I mean, it makes sense. So like I said, both sides talk a big game. No lawsuits end up coming out of it. But Davey is confirmed not working for Dragon Gate USA again. And and Davey never works another DG USA show. I've got a little bit of a blog post from Gabe Sapolsky here, the MySpace article that I just mentioned, where Gabe says, that's it. It's over with. It's in the past. I learned from it and will be better in the future. The focus is now on Evolve on March 13th and on Dragon Gate USA's first double shot on March 26th and March 27th in Phoenix. March is going to be one heck of a month, Gabe says. I started working on new lineups last night, and we have some exciting stuff in store for you. If TNA didn't pull the talent in 2004, there would have been no generation next. If Steve Carino made the Chicago booking, there would never have been the five-star Samoa Joe versus CM Punk match, which in turn led to my favorite all-time moment when Austin Aries defeated Joe for the belt two months later in Philly. It isn't about what happened in the past now. It's about what you make of it for the future. And I promise you the future is going to be very exciting and memorable. So Gabe saves face to an extent. I mean, he is clearly motivated by this to put on a better show and to book stronger cards. Whether that happens or not, Mike and I will discuss. But we are now at this point where Davey Richards is firmly in Camp Ring of Honor. And there is a tension between Dragon Gate USA and Ring of Honor that lasts through Dragon Gate USA's entire existence. Yeah, and this is something that if it wasn't going to be Davey, I bet there would have been another person that would cause this tension. It was just natural. Gabe was someone with that promotion from 2002 to 2008. The uh, person, that he, one of the people that he, that he found 
to buy the promotion after Rob Feinstein's scandal and Doug Gentry passed away was still in control of the promotion at that time. There's still, as we talked about in episode one, that that firing was not a pretty firing. So this was going to happen, Case. Like, I don't think I'm I'm off base in saying this. Like, there would have been, if it wasn't going to be Davey Richards, other than Davey being his own unique cat, it would have been someone else. So No, like, there's too many combustible elements at play because if it's not Davey, it's Kevin Steen or it's El Generico or it's Tyler Black. It's guys that are, you know, very opinionated and are, are – players in the way business is done you know not everybody can be chris hero and just magically work in between the lines and and seemingly become everybody's friend this relationship was going to blow up sooner rather than later and it probably was going to blow up this weekend because up until from 2006 to 2009 it was ring of honor was the alternative for wrestlemania weekend and then gabe as the person who was booking ring of honor said like hey dragon gate was the match that everyone was talking coming out of 2006 we have this new hot promotion we're going to be in Phoenix as well. And that became a huge thing. And arguably, probably the reason why WrestleMania week and ancillary events became such a big thing was Gabe showed like, okay, it just wasn't because how Ring of Honor still was. Ring of Honor was still the obvious number three, but showing that what would arguably be the number four, number five promotion in 2010 was able to run these shows and not completely take a bath pretty much meant like, okay, this is going to be a continual thing to current day. So like 10 years ago, like this was like, a big crowning moment, I feel like, on the United States Indies, the fact that this weekend even happened. I think my last note on the Davey situation is uh, in his 2012 High Spot Shoot interview, which is called Davey Richards, The Man Behind the Hunt, in which Davey, I, I had not seen this shoot before, which I, I have seen most of the High Spot stuff from around this time, because, uh, you know, 2012, you're dealing with Steen and Ring of Honor, you're dealing with the fallout with Jim Cornette, but guys are talking like Ronnie has a shoot interview, there's a, a Steve Carino, Jimmy Jacobs shoot, Kevin Steen has his own shoot interview, which spawns the Kevin Steen show, like there's a lot of content from that time that's really enjoyable. I had never seen the Davies shoot interview, the man behind the hunt, in which he sits in the high spots warehouse, in the high spots ring, in a hoodie like kind of like sitting in the corner like Ravenwood, but it's it's Davy and he's like in an affliction shirt for part of the time, but he's in a hoodie the other part of the time, and it's it's so uncomfortable the way it's set up. Like it's so Davy, which has been one of the most fun things about this project is just reliving just Davy Richards in the flesh. It's been just a wonderful experience. But Davy says what convinced him to stay with Ring of Honor was Carrie Silken saying uh, to go ahead and work both shows, that Davey could work Ring of Honor in Phoenix, while Davey was saying that Gabe said Drangate USA was created to put Ring of Honor out of business. According to Davey, Ring of Honor allowed him to work both shows that the idea would ha that Ring of Honor would have for first priority, and then the issue came when Gabe told Davey that he must only work Drangate USA and Evolve. Gabe would indirectly dispute those claims in his March 2015 shoot interview that he conducted with High Spots. Uh, it was Matt Stryker as the moderator for whatever reason, and then it was Gabe Sapolsky and Adam Pierce kind of shooting back and forth. Gabe says he made the most money he's ever had in the wrestling industry in 1998, selling ECW programs when WWE, WCW, and ECW were all doing well. So he understands that, you know, for wrestling to do well, promotions, multiple promotions have to exist and have to be healthy. But the reason I bring this up is, and I kind of said this a minute ago, but the tension between the WWN family and Ring of Honor, first of all, still exists to this day. I mean, guys do not work both promotions, but in the in the Drangate USA sense, and we'll talk about it, you know, 20 or so episodes from now, but in 2012, Ring of Honor tried to get Gabe to come back and accept a plaque for the 10-year anniversary show and all of this, and and the battle lines were still drawn, and it's something that now, because the two promotions are on such opposite ends of the spectrum, where Ring of Honor you know, was in a rebuilding phase, but they're whatever they are. They're the number three American promotion behind AEW, I think, ahead of Impact, but they're in a weird spot, and then Evolve is NXT for NXT, which, you know, their whole relationship is still very strange to me. PCAA. Exactly, NXTAA, there you go. Um, but guys still do not work for both promotions. And there's a point in time where a thing on the indies becomes, if you can book ring of honor guys versus Dragon Gate USA guys, that becomes a drawing match. And there's nothing like that on the independent scene now, just because, and it's probably, you know, it's probably for the best that there's not as much tension, but like, I remember PWG 
in 2013. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a, a huge factor to PWG's success was that they were able to get all of these guys in one place in 2013 they booked adam cole versus johnny gargano which was the ring of honor world champion versus the open the freedom gate champion and as a fan i looked at that as a really big deal because you just don't see that crossover to this day so this set the precedent for the next decade of independent wrestling yeah and especially what you would see in and especially like 2016 through 2018 when people would be unhappy if ring of honor would jump to evolve at that point there was the chasm and this was the chasm and it's something that's kind of forgotten that i feel like that was important for us to bring up even in the auspices of this guy who actually really enjoyed on these first four shows it, it's something that davy before this point i always thought he was fine but like watching these shows and watching these matchups then again he was against some of my favorite people in dragon system history so that helps but it's that this is like the end of like the true first chapter of the promotion. So Davey Richards leaves. It leaves Drangit USA without a focal point American to build their shows around, which is an issue that started here four shows into their history. And it seems like it would become a prevalent point up until Johnny Gargano gets the belt. And then from there, you know, it, you could argue Gargano lacks strong American challengers that if they weren't doing a special challenge, you know, Gargano versus insert Drangate wrestler here, they really lacked finding more Americans to build around. And Davey Richards is the start of that drama. Him leaving the promotion, not being able to follow up on the Kamikaze USA angle really opens the door for John Moxley because, you know, the last time we see Davey in the ring, he's with Gran Akuma and Shingo and Yamato and they're beating down the baby faces. And we never, we never see a payoff for that. We never even see the next step. We don't get, you know, Davey, Shingo and Yamato six man tags as good as those sound. We just, we don't get any of that. We don't get Davey and Tozawa together as Tozawa was on excursion. We get nothing. Instead, John Moxley, who is really the polar opposite of Davey Richards and everything he represents about wrestling, he finds himself now leading Kamikaze USA, whereas Davey Richards goes off to Ring of Honor. So we talked from basically the fall of 2009 through the spring of 2010. We're going to jump ahead about a year and a few months to June of 2011, and we're going to talk about Davey Richards winning the Ring of Honor world title at Best in the World 2011, this took place on our Enter the Dragon 2011 second anniversary episode. Uh, for as much as I love Dragon USA, I don't think they ever had a show quite like Best in the World 2011, just in terms of how big and important it felt. And this is June 6, 2011, so a little bit after our triple shot, but for all intents and purposes, this is either, uh, some people consider it the last show before Sinclair took over, some consider it to be the first show with Sinclair there, uh, but it is a loaded, loaded show with a dark match of Generation Me against Future Shock, an opener of Tommaso Ciampa defeating Colt Cabana, Jay Lethal defeating Mike Bennett, Homicide defeating Rhino in a street fight, Michael Elgin defeating Steve Carino, and then after the match, Kevin Steen would make his return to Ring of Honor. TV title match, El Generico wins the belt from Christopher Daniels. There is a four-way elimination match for the ROH World Tag Team titles with the world's greatest tag team, the All Night Express, the Briscoes, and the Kings of Wrestling. And the main event, a match that I rewatched yesterday and was blown away by just how good it was, Davey Richards winning the Ring of Honor World Heavyweight Championship from Eddie Edwards in 36 minutes. Oh, the famous effing Gen promo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I think my time was wrong there. I was, like, thinking maybe 2010 Ring of Honor and Dragon Gate were on the same level because they were arguing over Davey Richards, but, yeah, yes. clearly at this point. Yeah, I retract what I said. No, you're absolutely right. Because that show well, that show's I insane. mean, you just – you look at the optics of it, and I don't know if they sold out Hammerstein, but they're at least wrestling in front of a, a large capacity crowd in Hammerstein two weeks before, with all due respect to Yamato and Pac, two wrestlers who I obviously love – they're wrestling in front of 400 people at BB King's in the same city. So, uh, it, you know, it pains me to say it, but Davey was in the right. You know, he came out ahead in this situation. Oh, no, no, no. It, it definitely seemed to work out for him at the very least. So we see Davey Richards hit the highest of highs. He wins the Ring of Honor world title 
at Best in the World 2011 in front of a packed Hammerstein ballroom. This is the weekend that Sinclair began taking over Ring of Honor. Whereas Dranga USA, you know, they had a nice little weekend of shows. They had Pac versus Yamato headlining the second anniversary show, but they were running in front of a few hundred people in BD Kings, and you really, at that point, started to see the dichotomy. And even though I don't think a ton of people look back at 2011-2012 Ring of Honor as this incredibly healthy or exciting point in the promotion's history, but when you stack the two against one another, you could see that Davey Richards being in Ring of Honor was ultimately the right business move for both Davey and for the promotion. And, you know, it's, a, it's again, it's a little bit of a bummer. I would have really liked to have seen Davey stick around. So we go from, again, the highest of highs with Davey Richards. He wins the Ring of Honor world title. We talked about that in the summer of 2011. And now we go to the fall, the winter, really, the last show of 2012. This was Freedom Fight 2012. And we had to catch everybody up on the Team Ambition heist. This is a story that involves Davy Richards, of course. It also involves Kyle O'Reilly and Wheelman Tony Kazina. And if you've ever heard uh, Joe and Rich on the Voices of Wrestling flagship refer to Tony Kazina as the Wheelman, and you don't know why, this is the story that gave him that nickname. This is one of my favorite stories in the history of professional wrestling. It's pure insanity. And Mike and I broke it down in excruciating detail on our Freedom Fight 2012 episode. But Mike, we start with one of the most noteworthy and newsworthy things of 2012. This will be from the August 1st F4W edition And I will read this as slowly as I can because I know I have a habit to talk fast, but there is so much information here I want to make sure people understand it clearly. So I will read from F4W. Davey Richards was the center of controversy this week after clips appeared online of a high spot shoot video where he had very negative things to say about Ring of Honor, including calling Booker Jim Cornette out of touch. From talking to people within the company, there are many different opinions. One person defended him to a point saying nobody should judge the DVD without seeing the entire thing since High Spots is very good at editing together trailers that make shoot DVDs appear far more controversial than it ends up being. But the person noted significantly more people will see the trailer where in clips he buried the company than the final finished product whatever the contents of that may be. A lot of what he said in the trailer was stuff that he'd said before, and the trailer didn't include any explanation, if there was one, with what he took issue with regarding Cornette. Another person said there wasn't anything in the ROH contracts that prevented anyone from doing shoot interviews, but he was surprised that Richards and others didn't use better judgment when appearing in them, particularly since they're not very high paying. It was noted that regarding the morale in ROH, it really depends on who you are. It's not a black and white issue in the sense that there are definitely people who agree with the sentiment that Cornette's booking is outdated and others uh, who think that this statement is ridiculous and that Cornette has always booked effectively for whatever era or part of the country that he's been booking for. Those who are disgruntled are upset at the power structure for the top, feeling those in charge, and this isn't just Cornette, but those in Sinclair whose job it is to oversee operations, don't understand wrestling, and that the biggest issue remains the promises that Sinclair made at the beginning that they felt haven't been followed up on. One person who was more positive about how things were going noted that a pro wrestling company where everybody is happy simply doesn't exist. Regarding the video, this person noted that, yes, Davey had said many of these things before, but he also had a tendency to change perspective on things at the drop of a dime. So, Mike, we'll pause here because I I think it's been lost due to time and for as much controversy and headache as Ring of Honor might have now in the modern day. It is nothing like the summer of 2012 when it was routine. For wrestlers in their company, whether it be Roderick Strong, Kevin Steen, or Davey Richards, or Steve Carino, or Jimmy Jacobs, to publicly bury Ring of Honor in high spot shoot interviews, and Davey Richards did just that in the shoot interview titled The Man Behind the Hunt, Davey Richards. Yeah, and I think it's interesting the people who would do these interviews versus the company people, and if you look at the people who wouldn't do it a lot of those company people are still within ring of honor so maybe that tells you a whole lot but 
it, it it's something that 2012 as we've been like talking through it it's something that i i don't think it's like the biggest creative lull that they've had but it definitely was something where you could see it and that jim Cornette was not working as the booker of this thing it seemed like his read of this was pretty off and it was something that what may have worked as being an ovw booker back when ovw what while he had ownership of ovw was not paying off really with uh ring of honor and you know i mean it's something where i mean davy had himself a summer and for good reason where there are a lot of people who just kind of were just like their their hankles i guess is the word or like just like their ire was raised by davy just being davy and if and if there's one been one common thread in this series case it is at all times davy richards will be davy richards that is certainly one way of saying it. The man behind the hunt shoot interview teaser that is referenced in that F4W piece is still on YouTube. It's like a minute, 15 seconds long, and every second of it is absolutely hilarious. So I would recommend watching that. I think we referenced it when we talked about Davey's departure in early 2010. So it's nice to see that come full circle. I, I will say 2012 Ring of Honor with the exception of maybe some of the lulls in 2018 and 2019, it's the worst the company ever was. Now, we'll talk about a few cards in just a minute that, you know, one in particular is is probably my favorite show of the Sinclair era top to bottom, but the house shows at this point are dire. I mean, there's some really rough stuff. What Cornette always had, that it's funny, I actually think Ring of Honor in the current day has failed to do this, Cornette could book a main event that people were intrigued by, and he could he could book a main event that felt big and monumental to some aspect. But at just these cards, I that 2012 is a really rough time. It's it's a company that feels like it's dying, that has really poor aesthetic choices. Like 2012 Ring of Honor looks ugly from the in ring presentation to the graphics. It's just. We're a year into Sinclair at this point, and I would be very annoyed if I was working for Ring of Honor because you hear this big television corporation is coming in to take over, and then you look at what their TV looks like at the time. I, I would be annoyed. And it's something that, like, when we're talking about the production and about this, it would take basically up until the Bullet Club boom for them to put any money into production, like, to the extent of actually having a light rig versus using trusses and trees. It's something that. It, that it was such like a sticking point in the production style and the TV was just something that as we talked about when it happened they bought this company because they knew that they could get cheap easy things to draw eyeballs to their advertisers to fill up their affiliates and it was really up until the uh, the advent of uh, Bullet Club and how the New Japan relationship kind of formed and propelled it in the uh, later 2010s that that Sinclair ever saw that this was something worth investing money to. So it, it, it's something that like, I, I feel like the smaller things just keep on uh, having issues. But the bigger problem here is something that as we go through the notes for this week, we'll get sussed out pretty quick, but I think we should, th there's more stuff with Davey that I think is worth getting into because Mr. Richards had himself a fall and winter of 2012. I will continue reading from that same F4W piece. And they say, but that's not all. Nathan Blogdit of Magnum Pro in Council Bluffs, Iowa, wrote to us about an incident at a three-day series of shows this weekend. According to Blogdit, he had contacted Davey Richards, Kyle O'Reilly, and Tony Kazina, a.k.a. Team Ambition, to work a series of shows over the July 29th weekend. Blogdit said that all three showed up on time Friday, and Davey and his crew are notoriously late for many events, and were very professional and cordial with everyone. Saturday, a training seminar was scheduled to help offset some of the cost of bringing them in. All three were 30 minutes late, but texted the promoter to let them know, and nobody was bothered. Davey gave the students a lot of great advice, Blogdit said, but then began to bury many of the top stars to these up-and-coming kids. I'm sure it happens in all aspects of wrestling at times, Blogdit said, but what irked me is that he was taking time that these guys paid to learn to basically have his own little shoot interview. In the course of all of this, I overheard Davey tell the kids in the camp that it would be best for all of them to go, it would be best for them to go all places and work for free just to get beat up and learn. 
understandable in the sense of young guys just looking to branch out and get experience. However, in the exact same statement, Davey states, I don't work hard on these small indie shows like this, only to notice I was standing in earshot and heard every word. Immediate eye contact was made, and Davey fumbled around to save it by saying, except for tonight. This should have been a sign that things were not going to go correctly. That night at the show, Davey and the crew sat out by the sound table and openly criticized the show, the venue, and the talent very negatively with an earshot of all the fans. Later, a match with Kazina and Ryan Kidd, who is a 16-year-old, went awry. Nobody is saying exactly what happened, but Kazina told people that Kidd had disrespected him, and now it was time to teach him a lesson. Kozina proceeded to take liberties and stretch and shoot on a 16-year-old kid just looking to get work with someone who could teach him some stuff about wrestling, legit choking a minor on a couple of occasions, as well as very dangerously performing wrestling maneuvers that could have had a very negative impact on kids' health and well-being. While all of this was going on, Davey Richards and Kyle O'Reilly stood in the backstage area and shouted respect numerous times, very vocally and very obnoxiously, to get their air quotes gimmick over, or to just disrespect everything that was taking place. A YouTube video shows the two having what appears to be a combination pro wrestling match and a light no-gi grappling match. Kozina applied a triangle at the end and Kid allegedly went unconscious. It does not really look like what one would consider to be a shoot in any typical pro wrestling sense, though it is definitely not a worked encounter from start to finish. So let's pause there, Mike. <laughs> yes, we are th- th- off there's to a an lot to get into. Incredible start. Yes, I, you have the floor. Uh, two days with Davy Richards. Uh, this is what it's like. Well, I I tried to go and see who these some of the people who are on this show. Uh, Magnum Pro were only covered on Cage Match starting in 2013, so I don't have that card. But Ryan Kidd is a name that is has an interesting kind of history, especially like an interesting somewhat of a link. Uh, Outside of this case, are you familiar with Ryan Kidd? Is this the only time that you've heard of Ryan Kidd? I know he at least was working up through last year because I know Lee Morardi wrestled him at one point, but I am not super well versed in his catalog of work. So I'm trying to pull up the exact time. Uh, Ryan Kidd uh, did did some training in Dragon Gate. He was in Kobe for a while. Like, after this. I like, completely like, forgot about that, but you're right. Yeah, yeah. It was the same time. Do you remember, like, the Hurricane Ram- Ramirez that came through? Or the Ciclon R- Yes. Uh, oh, oh, yes, yes, I do. Yes, yeah, yeah. He was in the dojo at the same time. So, this is one of the things I know I've talked about on previous shows. Like, people come and will just pay to train. And he paid to train. So, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's something that was very much uh, the, the whole him burying all the other works and saying go get beat up by free i mean that's a certain mindset within people within wrestling that i think is uh, counterintuitive in a lot of ways and because that's just then if you say you work for free then you're already going to have promoters that think you'll just wrestle for free even if you're not training you know like it's something that like at the very least there should be some compensation in my opinion if not like you know full compensation but it's and then you get into, like, the Tony Kazina match. And have you seen this match? Because I watched some of this, like, back when it happened. And, yeah, I mean, Tony Tony Kazina, who at this time was, I believe, uh, 40. Yeah, he was uh, 42 at this time, beating up a 16-year-old. Like, there's another way of putting it. He beat up a 16-year-old for, like, this and then choked him out. It was just one of those more kind of insane things to, like, watch and see – happen you're like who does this and then you like you look at like who he's trained i mean he's someone who's trained by billy jack haynes and matt Bourne. so like he's someone that like came through a certain system in a way but doing that to a 16 year old kid and it's something that i think in a lot of ways has kind of followed him for the remainder of his career and i think that's one of the reasons why other than his age that tony kazina now just trains and i don't know if he's doing anything after leaving the Fale dojo but he was one of the trainers there because that was kind of the work in wrestling this guy could get did you ever see this uh shoot fight no i looked for it on youtube today and it was not there i know it's available on smart mark video but i have not made the purchase yet yeah i don't blame you but yeah it's just one of those things that i mean this happening like back to back with davy and then even more so the thing happening on sunday just kind of 
just went insane. It's one of the more insane things that I believe that really kind of like lost to this. And I think that like newer fans might not have heard of what you're about to read here, but it's one of the more like cavalier and insane things that have happened. And it's one of the reasons why Davey at this point really has like a deserved reputation. So let's get into Sunday when Blogdit said that it all came to a head. He said, I informed the guys via text uh, the address of the show and that doors open at 3.30 p.m. And he sent that text at 9.16 a.m., giving the guys plenty of time to be where they were supposed to be for the day. At 1.54 p.m., I began to get text messages from Tony asking if the card could be changed to put all of them against four guys from APW so that they could lighten the workload. Apparently, Tony had dinged up his foot and Kyle had tweaked his back. As I was relaying info to the promoter, the promoter said he would be all right doing this, but since he didn't get what was agreed upon, he would appreciate it if they lowered the rates. Shortly after I replied to Tony, he said, we'll talk when we get there, and that was a little after 2 p.m. Between this time and the next time I got a text from Tony at 3.46 p.m., Tony begins texting with the promoter from Davey's phone. I was privy to all that was happening, uh, all that was being said, and the promoter went back and forth with Tony for over an hour and a half numerous times saying that they were only 20 minutes away and things of that nature. First, Tony agreed to the original plan, then changed it again and said, no, we are going to do this and things of that nature. The promoter tried coming up with many different ways to appeal to both the the guys and make it feasible for him since he was not getting what he agreed upon. It was time for doors to open and the guys still weren't there. The APW promoter had a tough choice to make and he told them that they were no longer needed on the show and that they could just go home after being told that as doors were opening that they were 45 minutes away. Tony got in touch with me and stated that the promoter was trying to pull a fast one on them. I was obviously aware of the situation and stated that it was out of my hands and that I felt nothing was being pulled and the promoter was justified in his actions. At this point, Davey begins to start contacting me personally. I sent Davey to the promoter because I said again that it was out of my hands. Davey told the promoter numerous times that he is not allowed to cancel them and that he has no choice that they are coming to work and get paid. They showed up four minutes before the main event, which was then pushed forward to give these guys one last opportunity to do something because, quote, Davey couldn't just lose $300. Once they arrived, Davey went from being sincere to being pushy and violent in a matter of moments. Once I started hearing threats against the APW promoter, I walked outside to step in. There is no reason for four men to threaten a 115-pound promoter who was only looking out for his company. After the threat of violence and the statements from Davey saying that if he called Jim Cornette, that Jim would condone all of Davey's actions, including beating someone up literally half his size, I helped defuse the situation and came to an agreement for a very, very last minute match. As the boys came in and suited up, just Kyle and Davey, they all chatted amongst themselves while doing so. It did not register with me quickly what was about to take place. Tony was slowly carrying their bags to the vehicle in which the student was already at. We chatted with Davey really quick about the match details and figured out a finish. Everything seemed cool. As the first guy went to the ring, I heard a little ruckus, and as my music began playing, I turned around to see Kyle O'Reilly sprinting out the back door. The promoter had agreed to give them their money up front as a sign of good faith and that everything was cool and this new match would go on as planned. Obviously, there was a reason that Davey Richards demanded the money up front. After all was said and done, the boys from Team Ambition have been making light and poking fun at the fact that they robbed the same people who work in the same business that they do. They cheated the fans no matter how many were in the crowd. Mike Spears, my goodness. Welcome to the era of the wheel man. <laughs> this is one of the the most <laughs> like and I'll say this much, one of the most carny things to have happened in, a, in like the last while and it's just so nuts. To like like the way that like it, it, as reading this like, like at what point if you were the promoter you're like oh something's not on the level I should just say just stick with it. we don't need you anymore. We're good or you do your agreed upon matches. Like when they like were constantly saying they're 20 minutes away and it's clear it was a stalling tactic when they showed up when they say Davy couldn't just leave 300 lose 300 dollars like there were so many things that that they were going to pull this thing and i forget who like the student was at this time because team ambition were the three of them 
uh, O'Reilly, Cozina, and Richards, and like a student that I think completely has like drifted out of history. But what a wild story! And the introduction of why Tony Cozina has forever been called the Wheelman ever since. The student was Jeremy Hall. Does that? Oh no, I'm sorry. That was the Booker for APW. I hate to throw him under the bus. My apologies to Jeremy Hall. I was reading the wrong name in APW Ponderings article. Uh, yes, Tony Cozina is forever the Wheelman. I don't know what my favorite part of this is, Davey Richards threatening to beat up a promoter or Davey Richards justifying it by saying that Jim Cornette would be okay with it. it the, the thing that should be contextualized is that it, the reason that he fought, the promoter fought to get Davey Richards on the show and to kind of bend over backwards for him, with the exception of Kevin Steen and El Generico, Davey Richards is the biggest star in the indies at this point. That is why this was, one, such a big deal, but two, why the promoter was so forgiving and willing to give in to Davey, because having Davey Richards on your show, I mean, Davey is, has never been Chris Hero, who will work whatever show for whatever audience and will try his hardest. Davey has always been a little bit more selective with his bookings. He doesn't do a lot of jobs, and, and for Davey to, you know, come to this promotion in Iowa, it was going to result in some more DVD or MP4 buys from Smart Mark at the time. So it meant something to the business to have Davey Richards on your show. And then we end up with the great Iowa heist. I should also note that uh, Kyle O'Reilly posted a blog the Monday afterward and essentially said, yeah, what the promoter said was true. Did we threaten his life? No, but his story is, is pretty accurate. And from there, you know, Ring of Honor booking at the time had just split up Davey and Kyle. It was now transitioning into Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish after Bobby Fish left Evolve. So we start seeing the, the kayfabe breakup of Kyle O'Reilly and Davey Richards. But in a very real sense, uh, Kyle, smartly, because I think Kyle is, by all accounts, one of the nicest people in the industry. And I think he's one of the most talented people in the industry. And I hate that he works where he does because now I just never watch him. But he made a career decision to distance himself from Davey Richards after this. I think the only place they consistently worked together after this incident was AAW, where they still teamed on a pretty regular basis through the end of, of Davey working there. But yeah, that is the great Iowa heist. That is why if you ever hear the flagship uh, Rich Kreish and Joe Lanza talk about Tony Cozina, he is always the wheelman Tony Cozina, and it comes from the great Iowa heist, a, an episode of, of Dark Side of the Ring that I hope is made one day. Oh gosh, I just imagining just like Davy Richards at this point looking insane in five years, just uh, talking about this, having like no memory of it whatsoever, and then and then very straightly Kyle Riley like, yeah, no, I was young in the business, and this happened, and like this happened, and then Tony Casino wherever he is have to sit down and talk to it, and then Nathan Bloggett, who uh, I believe he he I'm not gonna say whose gimmick is because I don't think that is a thing, but like he was a known wrestler at that time in the Midwest, but yeah, no, it's something that. The indies were in such a state in 2012 that e even though we've talked about how Ring of Honor have been having these issues and talking about Dragon Gate USA having these issues, it was an overall lull in the whole entire industry that happened when, when that most recent class of people all went to WWE, NXT starting up, and just in a way tapping out the indies in a way that would happen a lot back then, but it was slowly repopulating and that we don't really have in 2019, 2020. So... It made sense with all this, but yeah, no, Kyle O'Reilly, because I feel like almost like soon after this, Kyle also moved out of St. Louis where they all were based in, because I know that like, that was one of the reasons why T Team Ambition was things that they were all based around St. Louis. So it really was something that then, since then, like, I don't think there really has been much of any Kyle O'Reilly and Davey Richards interactions, I think. No, they, they wrestle on a PWG show against one another in 2013, and I think that's the last one-on-one -on -one they had. I mean, Ring of Honor worked a program, you know, Red Dragon versus American Wolves, for most of 2013 until Davey finally exits the company, but it is very clear that Kyle made a personal decision to say, hey, maybe not this guy uh, after this, but, but Mike, that's not all the Davey Richards news we have October 23rd wrestling observer newsletter. 
There was an issue with Davy Richards and Future Shock wrestling in England. When Richards did his tour of the UK a few months back, he wrestled for the uh, wrestled for the promotion against its champion Jack Gallagher. During the match, there was an accident and Gallagher ended up being knocked out. Richards, to save the match, had no real choice but to pin Gallagher and win the championship. It wasn't what they wanted to do, but it was understood that it was the only real option at the moment. Richards agreed to come back and drop the title. Their owner, Dave Pownall, claimed Richards pulled out two days before the planned rematch, saying that he wasn't going to get on the plane for anything less than twice the agreed fee. Between that and the cost of flying him in, they said they couldn't afford it. They asked, since the booking had fallen apart, if Richards could at least send in a video. Richards sent a, a video via email 20 minutes after the show started. They had to get internet access to download it and edit it, and with the exception of the guy doing the editing, nobody saw it until it played at the show after the main event ended. The sound and video quality wasn't good, and the video was not the outline of what they had asked him to say, but instead his running down the company. Davey uh, Richards sent an email to Damian Smith of the promotion on October 5th saying, I've told you and Dave now that I am not coming over because we could not agree on the price. Like I said before, since I am the champion, my price has to go up so my old fee needs to be at least doubled before I come over. I had no recollection or maybe even knowledge of this until Mike reminded me, or I guess, you know, let me know about this. It just, it never ends with Davey. Even now in 2020, it never ends. It, it It's something where he is such a uniquely just, uh, I, I mean, there, there are certain people that are messy and love drama, and there are some people that just drama just happens around them. Drama happens around him, but I'm not entirely convinced that he does not love drama. You know, like, it seems like he lives for it. And it's just one of those things that, like, Especially, like, this was way before, like, Boom Era uh, UK as well. So, like, flying over Davey Richards, like, you were talking about, like, how he was one of the stars that traveled. That was, like, a serious thing that, like, you would, like, put together, like, a tour of, okay, you would go here, you go here, you go here. And all these promotions would then chip in for the flight. So, him pulling this didn't necessarily just, like, mess over one promotion. It messed over a whole lot at once. I have to thank, by the way, at HP Joker on Twitter. He sent me the aforementioned Tony Kazina versus Ryan Kidd match. It is so uncomfortable to watch because it's not this vicious, like, dojo-style mauling. It's really just like Tony Kazina wanted to shoot grapple with this 16-year-old, and the 16-year-old didn't know what to do. The 16-year-old's mom is in the crowd trying to give the kid advice as the match goes along. It is one of the wildest things. I would I would share the link, but it is an unlisted uh it's an unlisted YouTube video. But thank you to HP Joker for sending that my way. A thoroughly enjoyable watch to cap off, you know, Davey and the Wheelman and Kyle O'Reilly, Davey screwing over UK promoters. And as it's been talked about, you know, after this, Kyle O'Reilly seemingly made a conscious effort to distance himself from Davey Richards. I do not blame him. Things have obviously worked out very well for Kyle O'Reilly. He is uh, one of my favorite wrestlers still, so more power to him. So we see Davey really just butting heads with Ring of Honor. You know, Davey would always say to him, ROH was carry-owned and Gabe-operated. And we're now at a point where it's Sinclair owned and Delirious slash Jim Cornette operated. And Davey, despite being pushed to an incredible degree, is just not feeling it. And that is how we end up in the situation that we are on the Revolt 2014 episode. We break down the last half of Davey Richards 2013. Everything that led to him leaving Ring of Honor, which again, I think it is an underrated and under-talked about story as to just how wild things got. And then we talk about Davey crawling back to Gabe Sapolsky and winding up wrestling AR Fox on Evolve 25. Primarily for our timeline this week, we've tried over the past 46 episodes to really give the listeners an understanding of what else is going on in the wrestling world to contextualize where Dragon Gate USA was at in the pecking order and what members of the roster had gone on to do once they left the promotion. 
And we are turning things back all the way to beginning this week, Mike. We have a ton of news to talk about when it comes to the man, the myth, the legend that is Davy Wesley Richards. There is no one in this, in this whole entire project that has provided me with more unintentional mirth and just like intrigue. And I, and I was following everything pretty actively at this time, but like, I don't think people realize how much of a tremendous weirdo Davy Richards is. And if anything, if there was anyone who's going to do a supercut of Davy things on the show, I feel like that we, if anything, the supercut of Davy Richards as it revolves around 2009, 2014, just makes me so happy. So, Case, what did Wesley do this time? So, around this time period, there were three names in Ring of Honor that were rumored to be moving elsewhere. And those three names were Eddie Edwards, Roderick Strong, and Davey Richards. Now, the rumor at the time was that Dave Lagana, who had either just joined TNA or had just been promoted in TNA and now had a lot of power, and I don't know what the answer is, but the word going around, and Dave talks about this in The Observers at the time, is that Lagana wanted to do yet another rebranding of TNA, and they were going to enter into a new direction and a new era for the promotion, and Lagana wanted to build around Davey, Eddie, and Roddy. The thing is, Davey has a million things going on at the time, and it begins to get really bad between him and Ring of Honor. We've talked throughout this show about how, specifically in late 2011, towards the tail end of the Cornette run, and into early 2012, where he's having legitimate problems with Kevin Steen while they're working a world title program together, that Davey Richards is really unhappy with the Sinclair-owned and operated Ring of Honor. Davey has said on record to him, Ring of Honor is carry-owned, game-operated. He's now living in the Sinclair universe, and it's not really working for him. So what happens is, we enter November of 2013, Davey works on a Ring of Honor house show, The Golden Dream, from Cincinnati, Ohio, which is actually a real standout show from this time period. I'm assuming because this is a Sinclair show that it's on the Honor Club gimmick, and I would recommend checking it out. But Davey works ACH on that show. It's an awesome match in a really cool building that Ring of Honor didn't run too many times. They go out there, and they kill it. Two weeks later, Ring of Honor runs another Midwest double shot in Dearborn and Columbus, Ohio. On the first night, Davey loses a singles match to Roderick Strong. And on the second night, Davey loses a tag match with Eddie Edwards to Outlaw Inc. of Eddie Kingston in a homicide. Now, this was all building towards a match at Ring of Honor's Final Battle, which we'll talk about a little bit more in depth next week. But the match on Final Battle was going to be the American Wolves versus Jay Lethal and Roderick Strong. And it was, I believe, billed as the American Wolves' farewell, because no matter what happened after that show, they had given their notice to Ring of Honor that they were going to be moving on at the time. But what happens is, a few weeks before ROH Final Battle, Ring of Honor announces publicly that Davey Richards will not be booked on the show, that they are essentially revoking his invitation. And it all goes back to an interview that Davey had done with the British wrestling magazine Total Wrestling, And I will read you some of the quotes from this. This comes from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter on November 25th, 2013, where Dave says, The key quotes from the Total Wrestling interview were, When asked if ROH changing the tag titles on three shows helped the tag team division, Davey said, Nah, those belts don't mean anything anymore anyways. When asked about the iPay-Per-View issues, Davey said, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. If they can't get their crap together, that's their problem. I just worry about showing up, doing my job in the ring, and they can do whatever they want with that stuff. It's their deal. When asked about the ROH singles title, Davey said, In my opinion, that title has been devalued vastly for the last few years. The booking of it has been really substandard and screwy. It helps guys get bookings when they're holding it, but it's kind of a death touch because you work hard to get it, and then it's like you realize how screwy things become and how the booking is so screwy with it. It's just like a piece of metal, unfortunately. It has a rich history. I mean, look at the guys who have held it. Most of them, most of them, have been very deserving in my opinion. When asked about if TNA is sold, because at the time there were rumors that Dixie Carter was trying to sell the company, when asked about if TNA is sold, would more talent from ROH go there, 
Davey says, who's even in TNA? No idea. <laughs> apart from Aries, Joe, guys like that. Oh, and TJ Perkins. But they've got him wrestling as some stupid skeleton man. End quotes. <laughs> Davey rules like, like <laughs> God. Like if we want to compare and contrast this to the last time that he left ROH and how he ended up with DG USA and evolve as it started, pretty much just saying the same things, just completely running it down and he's just running it back here, case, and it's tremendous. Like, of course he doesn't care about the eye pay per view issues. Do we think that Davey Richards has ever ordered an eye pay per view in his life? <laughs> oh my god of course he hasn't it's it's just it's unreal how scorched earth he goes in this interview as a contracted talent and a pushed commodity like it's it's still 2013 they've reunited the wolves and davy him showing up to independence i think still really mattered at this time he was just coming off of a UK tour, which I, I kind of directly associate the foundation of that UK boom. Maybe some European listeners might disagree, but I credit two guys as being Americans that went over there and really made people take notice of that scene. One of them being Davey Richards, who had just wrestled Zack Sabre Jr. and Tommy End and Dave Mastiff, who was kind of a first wave UK indie star. The other being Colt Cabana, who I just I think because of his podcast, and the fact that he was over there all the time, they really drew attention to that scene. But Davey still mattered to the independent scene, and he goes completely scorched earth in this interview to a point where Ring of Honor pulls him from the shows. Now, Dave notes that none of Davey's heat was with the wrestlers. Even by this time, he had made up with Kevin Steen, and they were cool. He just had a unique hatred for, I guess, partially Delirious, partially Joe Coff, and just that entire Sinclair office. And I should know. It's oh, wonderful. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, it's wonderful. And something that's worth keeping in mind, at one point, as we talked about on the show, he got a massive, massive raise from Ring of Honor like, to the extent that basically was at least a two times raise coming back into the company. So this isn't like someone who's being bitter and not getting paid well and not getting booked. This is one of their biggest f feature acts just deciding to salt the earth on his way out. He was a tag team champion that summer. So the thing he was referring to with the tag titles was... Red Dragon won the belts from the Wolves, or for, I'm sorry, from the Briscoes at the anniversary show in Chicago, which we talked about. That was the uh, the real formation of Scum as a super unit, and then the television tapings that we spent a lot of time on talking about the shows in 2013 and how poorly they drew. So from there, the belts go from Red Dragon to Forever Hooligans, who win the belts at a TV taping in Providence, Rhode Island. Two weeks later, the Wolves beat Forever Hooligans on an all-star extravaganza show. And then uh, two weeks after that, the Red Dragon beats the American Wolves in New York City. And then from there, they go on to have a tag title run. So they, the Ring of Honor played hot potato with the tag belts. I remember as a fan thinking it was actually kind of interesting because that Forever Hooligans win was something that no one saw coming. It was a, a television tapings on Providence, Rhode Island. The hooligans were just popping in from New Japan, and they ended up winning the belts. And it was it was kind of exciting, but Davey did not seem to think so. And I should note that he buries Impact at the end of that, that interview. He debuts in Impact Wrestling on January 16th, 2014. Which, <laughs> do, do you remember his TNA debut? Well, if I'm right, was this before or after... Uh, I'm trying to remember what, what their names were. Oh, we're, we're getting John? to that. It's it's uh, it's after, my friend. Okay, okay. Uh, no, I don't remember what his debut was then. So no. the, the TNA debut, which as a fan, I remember at this point I'm still watching Impact Weekly, but I it was like appointment viewing this week because I knew the Wolves were going to be on the show. And their debut is that they are walking down a hallway and Dixie Carter confronts them. And basically says, like, oh, I've heard so much about you guys. How about you guys get a tryout match next week? And Davey essentially goes, no toots. We signed contracts already. And Dixie Carter is annoyed with them for doing that. It is such a gloriously stupid way to debut uh, the team that would then go on to be the Wolves in Impact Wrestling. I mean, I, I, I like to believe that that segment sounds like a shoot, basically. <laughs> 
So, Mike, what you were referring to was the American Pitbull's debut in NXT. This happened. It was taped on November 21st. It aired on December 18th, 2013, if you'd like to find it on the award-winning WWE Network. This is when the American Pitbull's of Derek Billington and John Cahill showed up to Full Sail University on a, a single episode of NXT. I'll run down this full card. It was Sami Zayn and Tyson Kidd defeating Antonio Cesaro and Leo Kruger. Page defeating Sasha Banks, The Ascension defeating the American Pitbulls, and then an NXT title lumberjack match with Bo Dallas defeating Adrian Neville. That is not a bad hour of TV, Mike. No, this was when NXT was a very easy watch. They were on Hulu. This was pre-network. And it, you know, I mean, this was just like a wild thing that, and then Davey coming out of this was more wild about than ever, which is the fact that they had basically a, and it wasn't even like a squash match, right? Because the thing during the Ascension match was they were just running through people, but the Pitbulls put up like, when I say it was not a squash match, it still was like four minutes long, but it wasn't just like three moves and that was it. Yeah, it's a four minute match that was certainly pushed at the time as one Tenzai, Lord Tenzai, it's on commentary, and he is constantly pushing the fact that these men are known around the world and that they were stars in Japan. And two, they give the Ascension, compared to everyone else, kind of a run for their money. And this is, you know, a, a promotion that, again, you've got Sami Zayn, you've got Antonio Cesaro, you've got Neville working in the promotion now, but the Pitbulls, or the American Wolves, are still in that first wave, really, of indie talent that is being brought into the promotion. And not only indie talent that's being brought into the promotion, but indie talent that is being promoted as being stars outside of the world of the WWE. So this match happens. What's notable here is there are two things. One, Dave talks about in The Observer at this time how the Wolves had originally been booked to do, I think he said two or three television tapings. Yeah. And this is the only time we ever see them. And I have heard rumblings nothing that i know concrete enough to say exactly what happened but i think there is some anger on both sides as to maybe the pitbulls not taking things home as quickly as they should have maybe they were trying to get their shit in and then the other thing is that david richards in this match takes a bump straight to his neck yeah yeah and the story was that Davey Richards never wanted to work for WWE. He never wanted to try out. It was because Eddie Edwards wanted to give it a go. He's like, yeah, I'll try out there. And, of course, Davey just then decides to have a match against the orders and then gets hurt. You know, I mean, that's Davey for you. Yeah, it's crazy to think that Davey wrestles his last Ring of Honor match in November of 2013. Eddie wrestles his final Ring of Honor match in December of 2013. And as of this recording in February of 2021, they have not been back. That's insane to me. Well, I mean, have you seen Eddie Edwards lately in TNA? <laughs> Unfortunately. Or Impact? Yeah, I mean, and, you know, it just seems like that whatever heat they had, and, I mean, Impact pretty much took care of both of them, so it makes sense. Yeah, so... Impact takes care of them. Davey Richards, on the other hand, because of this neck injury, does not take care of pro wrestling Noah. Davey was booked on essentially a farewell Noah tour that had been hyped up for quite a long time. Remember, we talked about this in, uh, I guess it would have been the third anniversary, or I guess the fourth anniversary show episode, where Ring of Honor had booked Ishimori and Marafuji for a pay-per-view in Canada. Marafuji got hurt, had to pull out, so they put Paul London in his place, and Davey ends up wrestling London instead of Marafuji. Well, they now get to a point where they want to book Davey to come back to Japan. He hasn't been in Noah in so long. There was a lot of bad blood there when he left. They want to bring him back. They want to have him wrestle Taiji Ishimori for the GHC Junior Heavyweight title on the December 7th Akira Tawe retirement show. And Davey Richards... Now, Davey says that Noah decided to unbook him after Davey hurt his neck in the NXT match. <laughs> That's an interesting way of going about it. I don't think that's what happened, but bottom line is Davey does not show up to the Noah tour. I mean, you're disrespecting Akira Tawe, for one. And two, come on, Davey. We know the we know the thing there. It, it, it's such a Davey Richards thing to say, like, oh, I hurt my, my neck on NXT thing. I'm not going back to Noah after all these big things and for a big Noah show. Like, that was 
that was not a Budokan show for Taui, right? That was a sumo hall. It was a uh, not differ Ariake. What's the one that's bigger than that? Oh gosh, it's the one they used to own. The uh, Ariake Coliseum is that it? Yes, Ariake yes. Coliseum. Yeah. So yeah, that was that is where that show was. It was Taui's retirement show, and Davey was supposed to wrestle Ishimori, which in 2013 that match would have been incredible. Are you kidding me? And unfortunately, it does not happen. Uh, did just so I have this out there. Uh, Ariake Coliseum, not the one owned by Noah. That was different Ariake. Ariake Coliseum still exists, and it seats ten thousands in Kota Ward, Tokyo. Yeah, I I mean, does anybody run there? I don't know the last time I've seen a show there. Ah, uh, you know, I mean, it's been open since uh, eighty seven, so like it has had places run there, but no one like people like run that like it, it seems to be a place that people will run instead of sumo hall and then of course like right now no one's gonna run it you would think that ariaka coliseum 10k right now you just easily have that get 5k there for shows for tokyo based promotions but it does not seem like it's a thing it also has a retractable roof and there you have it that is dragon gate usa and Davey Richards and everything big that happened to Davey from 2009 through really the end of 2013. He ends up working uh, pretty much full time for Gabe in 2015 until injuries get in his way. And then he was booked on Evolve shows and then he pulled out of Evolve shows. And then it just became Davey and Gabe all over again. And that is, you know, some of the last times that he was featured prominently in any promotion. He still wrestled in Impact through 2017. And unfortunately, he's been away from the spotlight ever since. But during the String at USA Rewind and Rewatch series, we consistently found humor and delight and joy in the story of Davey Richards because his in-ring work was so good. Davey versus Shingo, Davey versus Yamato, Davey versus Mochizuki. Those matches were so much fun. And unfortunately, the in-ring fun ended there. But my God, it only just began a fascinating career, one that I just, I, there's there's so much other stuff you could do throughout the, the history of Davey Richards' career. You know, I, I not a lot of people necessarily know the story, the myth, that originally, and the story goes, that, that Gabe wanted to bring Davey Richards in, and his first night in Ring of Honor, he was going to beat Brian Danielson for the Ring of Honor World title. Now, that's a story that, that Gabe has later denied I don't remember where Davey stands on it, but it's a story that's out there, and it's a story that people knew about, and it seems like ever since Davey was brought into Ring of Honor until he left the spotlight in 2017, he was just, God, drama followed him. Just a fascinating, fascinating individual. So I'm glad that we were able to compile these clips. I'm glad that we're here celebrating the career of the American Wolf, Davey Richards, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed the Drangit USA Rewind and Rewatch series if you listen along. If you're dipping in for this now and you want, you know, more content like this, we have over 80 hours of audio on Drangit USA and the U.S. independent scene from 2009 through 2014, all on the Open the Voice Gate podcast feed. I can't recommend it enough. I am Case Low. I'm on Twitter at underscore in your case. My, my, co-host my wonderful wonderful friend who you heard on these clips mike spears he is on twitter at fuji Heo with two eyes like don fuji and if you want to get in touch with the show we are at open voice gate on twitter i thank you for listening to the life and the times of davy richards in dragon gate usa